Dinosaur Don Glute. And I'm Christy Block. We're your guides through the fantastic world of Dinosaur, dinosaur movies. movies. century and a half, people have been fascinated by dinosaurs, those fabulous reptiles that ruled this planet for some 160 million years. And since the earliest days of the movies, filmmakers have met this challenge, how to bring these animals that no human being had ever seen in the flesh to life on the screen. Sure, artists can show us how dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures may have looked in life. But the best place to see living, breathing dinosaurs is the movies. Movies about prehistoric life go way back to the stone age of the cinema. Long before the dawn of talking or roaring pictures. Prehistoric Peeps was a British film made in 1905, inspired by a series of popular cartoons published in Punch magazine. There was also the prehistoric man made in 1908 by Walter R. Booth, a magician who brought his stage magic to the screen. The film showed drawings of a caveman and a dinosaur come to life, the caveman becoming a fast food lunch for the dinosaur. You see, even that far back, filmmakers were mixing up dinosaurs with cavemen. Even though people didn't exist on this planet, until over 60 million years after the last dinosaur died. Why? Hey, that's easy. That's because filmmakers are more concerned with drama than scientific details. We all know that animated cartoons are made by photographing a series of drawings, each drawing slightly different than the one before it. When we run those pictures through a movie projector, the pictures seem to move. The first classic character designed for an animated cartoon was a dinosaur, created by cartoonist Winsor McKay, famous for his comic strip, Little Nemo in Slumberland. McKay made the film in 1912. It starred that most popular of dinosaurs in a patasaurus, once called Brontosaurus. Her name was Gertie the Dinosaur. When McKay showed Gertie on his big screen back in the music halls, he stood about here and became part of the show with a routine that went something like this. He'd say, come out, Gertie, and make a pretty bow. show McKay stunned his audience by putting himself into the picture. Back in those days, films weren't as protected as they are today. So a few years after Gertie, another pioneer animator, John R. Bray, made his own version. Still, dinosaurs 
characters continue to be popular in cartoons, sharing the screen with many old favorites. Dinosaurs will always turn up in animated cartoons, as long as cartoonists enjoy drawing them, and we enjoy watching them. During the teen years of this century, dinosaurs were quite popular, due to a number of important fossil discoveries being made back then, and also the publication of some early science fiction tales. A good number of Stone Age movies were made back then, including comedies. In 1914, even Charlie Chaplin got into the act, his little tramp character dreaming himself through time back to his prehistoric past. A more serious attempt at depicting Stone Age life had been made two years earlier by movie pioneer D.W. Griffith. This picture was called Man's Genesis. In 1913, Griffith made a sequel, Brute Force, in which he pioneered some of the screen's earliest live-action prehistoric animals. Here he used a life-size mock-up of the horned meat-eater Ceratosaurus, described in the movie as one of the perils of prehistoric apartment life. Also, this may have been the first movie to use live reptiles dressed up to give them that prehistoric look, a trend that would continue for many years. Problem is, even in miniature settings, our modern day reptiles just don't look like dinosaurs. Oh, don't hurt his feelings. No offense. Talk about bit parts. As these test scenes prove, live reptiles aren't the best or most active actors. I've seen amateur performances before, but this? You have to shoot a lot of film and use only those parts where the reptiles follow their script. Secret of the Lock, a British film of 1934, tried passing this poor iguana lizard off as a dinosaur. shot back in 1964 and finally making its world premiere so you want to be in pictures in 1940 D.W. Griffith was set to direct 1 million BC a Stone Age epic again pitting cavemen against dinosaurs unfortunately Griffith didn't get along too well with the producer Hal Roach famous for his comedy films and so Griffith walked, but not before stamping the project with much of his own movie-making style. For its prehistoric creatures, Wendley and B.C. used mostly live animals, like this little beauty. Blown up, of course, to giant size. Special effects man Fred Knopf sometimes dressed up animals to make them look prehistoric. They were then shot in slow motion to give them weight. 
And with the dubbed in sounds of lions, elephants, dogs, monkeys, and even pigs, sometimes played at different speeds to make them sound prehistoric. A Brahma bull with extra hair and horns became a muskox, while an elephant sporting fake tusks and a fur coat became a mammoth. A tegu lizard, like this guy, earned his keep by wrestling a dimetrodon, played by a dwarf alligator, sporting the latest fashion in back fins. Also, stuntman Paul Stater, best known for doubling Johnny Weissmiller in the Tarzan movies, wore a dinosaur costume, making him a conspicuously short Tyrannosaurus. One Million D.C. was a hit back in 1940, and scenes and outtakes from the film ended up in a stock footage library where filmmakers can go if they don't have the money or know-how to shoot their own special effects. Chaos and of evil in a strange world. As a comet runs wild among the planets of the universe, challenged by furious forces of nature that defy explanation, a forgotten world of dark jungles, barren deserts, Stone Age mountains, and the belly of the dragon, alive with primordial animals. Of the dragons, where beast attacks beast, prehistoric monsters out of the past bring new thrills in the Valley of the Dragon. Some other movies enhanced by scenes from 1 million B.C.? Well, there's Tarzan's Desert Mystery, Gigantus the Fire Monster, The Ghost Jesters, Island of the Dinosaurs, Terror Vision, Two Lost Worlds, King Dinosaur, Adventure at the Center of the Earth, Journey to the Center of Time, Untamed Women, She-Demons, Attack of the B-Movie Monster, Horror of the Blood Monster, also known as Vampire Men of the Prehistoric Planet. The Serial Superman, Adam Man vs. Superman, and The Lost Planet. Plus Jungle Manhunt with Jungle Jim, Lost Volcano with Bomba the Jungle Boy, Smoky Canyon with the Durango Kid, and Spaceship Sappy with the Three Stooges. In my opinion, the best method of all for bringing dinosaurs to life on screen is about as old as the movie business itself. It's a process called stop motion, or dimensional animation. Here's a rather quaint example made by Virginia May in 1923 for the Path A Review series of short films.
comedies were still in vogue when caveman Buster Keaton made his entrance on board this stop-motion apatosaurus. One of the best modern-day stop-motion artists is Jim Danforth, Oscar-nominated for his work in the 1970 Hammer film, When Dinosaurs Rule the Earth. When they see When Dinosaurs Rule the Earth, and they see Victoria Venture for the first time. process uh, involving a, a jointed armature covered with foam rubber, it's possible to create a dinosaur that looks exactly like a real prehistoric dinosaur rather than a lizard or a man in a suit or some kind of costume like that. And so uh, this makes it possible to be much more authentic and also much more dynamic with the action because it, we can make the dinosaurs do whatever we want them to do. They can fight or... Uh, eat, browse, growl, roar, whatever it is that the dramatics of the script require. And it's totally under the control of the animator. It doesn't have to be uh, that the uh, whim of the animal, which may not want to perform that day if you're using a lizard, for instance. This is an example of a stop-motion armature so that it can be used to uh, position a rubber model rather than as with an animated cartoon where a series of drawings are created. Uh, we're able to shoot sequential frames of motion picture film and reposition the animation model slightly between each frame. If we were to take one exposure of this pose and then move the model slightly forward using the pointer as a gauge, take the pointer away and expose that frame and then repeat the process again and again and again 24 times for every second. When that sequence of frames is projected on the screen, we get the impression that the animation model is moving. Of course, this would be covered with rubber when we were actually filming it. This is a uh, example of how they are covered with rubber. This one is in the process of being made. The muscles are, are built up out of sheets of foam rubber. And then when the shape has finally arrived, that it, one can cover it with a casting of a lizard skin or a sculpted texture like this and rubber cement it down. This is the technique that was used for the dinosaurs in the lost world. So I get a big kick out of it, making them do what I want them to do. You know? A lot of fun. One of the first people to raise stop motion to an art was Willis O'Brien, a man who had a real love for dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures. O'Brien had been sculpting clay boxers at the 1915 World's Fair when he got the idea of how to make them move using stop motion and a borrowed newsreel camera. It's no big surprise that O'Brien did the same with the dinosaur, the ever popular Apatosaurus. Later, O'Brien expanded this short film and called it The Dinosaur and the Missing Link. The film was populated by clay figures that O'Brien sculpted over wooden armatures. It depicted a wacky, prehistoric world of lowbrow, slapstick comedy. of the movie camera was so impressed with O'Brien's picture that he bought it for his film company, released it in 1917, then hired O'Brien to make a whole series of Stone Age comedy shorts. These were kind of forerunners to the Flintstones, with cavemen proving the old adage, some things never change. In 1919, Willis O'Brien improved his techniques for a more serious movie, The Ghost of Slumber Mountain. 
no longer comic figures, his dinosaurs now had to look real. And so he worked under the guidance of famous paleontologist Barnum Brown. The result was this starkly realistic portrayal of prehistoric animals, quite the opposite of his earlier comedy efforts. scenes from this film proved to be quite durable. They were recycled for two documentaries, Evolution in 1923 and Mystery of Life in 1931. O'Brien's work in the Ghost of Slumber Mountain led directly to his being hired for The Lost World, made in 1925 by First National. The movie was based on a novel published in 1912, written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes. The Lost World was the first feature-length movie in which modern-day people find a prehistoric world untouched by time. It was the story of the flamboyant Professor Challenger, who sets out for a lost plateau hidden in a South American jungle. O'Brien did not make his own models, but worked with sculptor Marcel Delgado, who based all of his ancient creatures on the paintings and sculptures of that great artist of prehistoric life, Charles R. Knight. Delgado's new and improved models were fashioned over metal ball and socket armatures and given sponge rubber muscles and latex hides. scientists knew about dinosaurs back in 1925, these models remain among the most accurate ever to appear in a Hollywood movie. showed test scenes from the Lost World at a banquet in New York for the Society of American Magicians. None of these illusionists, not even the great Harry Houdini, could figure out how the scenes were accomplished. It was as if someone had actually gone back through time with a movie camera and photographed living dinosaurs. imagine how exciting it was to be eight or nine years old and see 49 dinosaurs on the screen for the first time in your life. There had been nothing like it previously. Uh, I say it was, uh, although it was totally silent, I think there were, it was augmented by lots of screams in the audience. And there was a theater uh, down in Los Angeles, uh, downtown that no longer exists. But in the, uh, before you went into the theater, there was a, uh, model of a brontosaurus about so size and uh, it was actually 
breathing. I guess they had an air pump there that was uh, making the stomach go up and down. I've often wondered what in the world became of that model. It would have been real grand uh, to have in a museum. The Lost World established two story themes that would later become dinosaur movie cliches. a prehistoric mountain or island or whatever, sometimes located around South America, with a volcano that's been dormant for millions upon millions of years. And then, just when the explorers arrive, the volcano erupts. prehistoric monster running wild through the streets of a modern-day city. In this case, is our old friend the Apatosaurus, a relatively peaceful critter who should be ashamed of setting such a bad example to Godzilla and all the other giant prehistoric monsters yet to come. at the time in order to publicize uh, the lost world i believe there were about 150 of these ashtrays were made and uh, the late widow of willis uh, as far as she knew this was the last one extant and uh, was quite thrilled that she made a present of it to me hey remember john gray's version of gertie well in 1927 he was at it again this time with the takeoff of the lost world effects were by Joseph L. Roop. There were also other interesting early variations on stop motion, like the silhouette figures animated by puppeteer Tony Sarg with the 1919 film Adam Raises Cain. from a German short film of the late 1920s. O'Brien and Marcel Delgado, who in 1931 teamed up again for an RKO project called Creation, from which these Triceratops scenes are among the only ones to survive. Thank you. 
Nation was to be directed by Harry O. Hoyt, the director of The Lost World. It was about a submarine crew stranded on a prehistoric promontory that had risen off the coast of, yes, once again, South America. Unfortunately, creation was never finished. Seven years later, director Hoyt would try to launch another dinosaur epic, Lost Atlantis. But that project, too, was doomed to a premature extinction. Fortunately for them, about that time, America was going through a kind of dinosaur craze. Mostly thanks to the Sinclair Refining Company, which, in 1930, had started using dinosaurs in their advertising. When RKO Pictures hired producer Marion C. Cooper to salvage various unfinished film projects, he looked at creation, which he saw as just a lot of animals walking around. At the time, Cooper had planned to film The Ultimate in Adventure, a modern Beauty and the Beast story about a prehistoric island ruled by a giant gorilla. Originally, Cooper had planned to use a man in a gorilla suit to play the ape, and live Komodo dragon lizards blown up photographically to giant size to impersonate the dinosaurs. But after seeing Creation, he was sold on stop motion and O'Brien and Delgado. Cooper hired them for his movie, which became the 1933 motion picture classic, King Kong. This fantasy adventure showcased some of the most lifelike prehistoric creatures ever to appear on screen. Once again, based on the artwork of Charles R. Knight. There have been a lot of mystery surrounding King Kong, just what was King Kong. Now, I think I and the rest of the world went to see King Kong, uh, expecting just primarily to see a story about a giant ape. We had no idea that we were going to be treated to a pteranodon that would try to fly away with Fay Ray and uh, a Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, fighting with Kong and a Stegosaurus and uh, Triceratops and all sorts of dinosaurs. That was really an added attraction. And, Something to my mind that uh, utterly ruined the remake of it later years on, that there were no dinosaurs. To me, that was sort of like uh, telling the Frank Sinatra story and not having him sing one note. In. King Kong was a huge success. And as happens today, it spawned a sequel which came out that same year. And like most sequels, The Son of Kong didn't quite measure up, either as a movie or as an ape. <laughs> O'Brien did effects for the color remake of The Lost World. You can imagine his disappointment when told that he couldn't use stop motion, this being the result. This is the greatest moment of your lives. There it is, directly ahead. A body of land uplifted by volcanic eruption a hundred million years ago. The land where monsters lived. You'll see man-eating vines that lure their prey. Spiders as tall as trees. 
air-raising attack by prehistoric monsters. <coughs> Battle of the Titans to the death. The most terrible creatures of destruction that ever walked the earth. Stunned by the horrifying 100 foot fire monster that guards a king's ransom in treasure. O'Brien inspired a lot of people with a talent for stop motion and a love of dinosaurs, the most famous of all being Ray Harryhausen. Well, my first interest in dinosaurs, I guess, started in my grammar school days. I remember picking up books and seeing the wonderful illustrations of Charles Knight. And uh, I, that probably goes way back to grammar school days. Then, of course, when I saw The Lost World, uh, that left a tremendous impression, Willis O'Brien's Lost World. I always remember the dinosaur falling off the cliff, the brontosaurus. And uh, later on, of course, when he made King Kong, uh, that blew my mind, and I haven't been the same since. So uh, dinosaurs have been my best friends from childhood. Well, King Kong, of course, was the most of the stimulus of my whole career. Uh, I remembered the lost world, as I said before, and, and so the Kong really opened up many different avenues of interest to me that I didn't have before. So uh, uh, it wasn't just the dinosaurs, it was uh, the whole structure, the whole atmosphere, the whole feeling uh, that happened to be on that day that left an impression I couldn't forget. The early 50s, America was enjoying another dinosaur fad. This was mostly due to the publication of this magazine, whose dinosaur cover, from a Pulitzer-winning painting by Rudolf Zallinger, left off every newsstand in the country. Capitalizing on the public's new awareness of dinosaurs and the bomb, Harryhausen invented the first atomic age prehistoric monster, the Retosaurus. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms was the first movie whose main theme was a giant prehistoric creature creating havoc in the modern world. The Beast in its original conception uh, went through many changes, of course. Uh, I remember we didn't want to use a uh, known prehistoric animal because it, the known prehistoric animals will simply be a remake of uh, the lost world, so to speak. So uh, I tried to design a, a completely new creature, and we came up with the name Redosaurus. And perhaps one day they'll discover bones that might fit to that concept. But uh, it was designed as a functional animal that would serve the purpose of the script. Yes, it could happen. For various authorities believe that buried somewhere under the polar ice right cap, in a state of suspended animation are the awesome creatures, the leviathans that roam the earth at the dawn of time. And under certain conditions, a nuclear explosion could free one from his icy tomb. Then, guided by instinct, the beast would come back, back to the caverns of the deepest Atlantic where it was spawned. An armored giant wreaking its prehistoric fury on modern man and his puny machine. Cities would be terrorized by the cruel intruder from the past. Populations crazed and panicked with fear by its destructive force. Granite and steel would crumble. Soldiers and their weapons would be powerless before the onslaught of the beast. The beast. The beast. The beast from 20,000 fathoms. Another one, Colonel? No. You know what the radioactive isotope is? No, but if it can be loaded, I can fire it. I'll load it. Just remember one thing. It's the only isotope of its kind this side of Oak Ridge, so you can't miss.
It inspired a lot of other movies, and as we'll later see, many made in Japan. The film also inspired me as a kid to pursue an interest in prehistoric life. Thanks, Ray. Dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures turned up in a lot of Harryhausen's movies. Looking at this old press book from the animal world uh, reminds me of uh, many memories of what happened on the sets. I remember in the early days, uh, Irwin Allen had heard about my uh, footage from the Evolution uh, film I was making on 16mm, and he wanted to blow it up and see if he couldn't use the footage for this section in the animal world. Uh, that became impractical. There wasn't enough footage to begin with, and um, so he decided to uh, get Willis O'Brien on the project, and uh, he would uh, uh, go in for animation. So we made very, uh, O'Brien designed very simple tabletop miniatures so that it could be done uh, very quickly. Uh, we had two cameras in order to get twice as much footage for the amount of time spent, and uh, everything was reduced to simplicity as, uh, as you would on a tabletop miniature. We had to go through a censorship problem when the picture was first released. Uh, the critics all said it was too gruesome. There were many shots, of course, of live animals slaughtering one another, lions attacking gazelles. And so in, uh, during the animation sequence, uh, the, some of the fights between the Allosaurus and the Triceratop got quite uh, violent and uh, bloody. So uh, at the first preview, we had to edit the film down and take some of the uh, more sinister scenes out. Well, the first one million years BC, of course, I saw when I was a child. And uh, when I was presented with the script uh, as a remake by the Hammer films, uh, I felt I could do better than putting a man in a dinosaur suit and hiding him behind a bush. And we remade uh, 1 million BC uh, with slight alterations. Uh, it was a pleasure to get back to dinosaurs again. They were my first love. and. Uh, they finally had to glamorize it a bit by putting uh, Raquel Welch into the film and uh, several other beauties, which Hollywood usually does, in order to make the picture palatable to the audience. Uh, I think if cave women in the early days looked like Raquel Welch, why well, we've regressed considerably today. <laughs> erupts on the screen with volcanic excitement. One million years B.C., when the Earth parted and the mountains fell. Primitive man and monstrous beasts fought each other to inherit the Earth. Dinosaurs. 
Minotaur in battle with the savage Ceratosaurus. He will share the unending thrills and excitement of a world of primitive wonders. Primeval terror and savagery. You will indeed live in another world. In another time, as the centuries fall back to reveal the Earth one million years BC. Guanji was actually a, a, a Willis O'Brien project that was started way back in 1942. Uh, I remember vividly going over to RKO and seeing uh, all of Willis O'Brien's sketches. He had uh, about six or seven mat shots already painted on glass. Uh, he had the uh, Allosaurus all uh, built for the test footage. And of course, hundreds of sketches and that impressed me enormously, and I always remembered that. And uh, when Charles and I, Charles Schneer, uh, my uh, associate for many years, when we were looking for a project, we uh, I found Willis O'Brien's old script in my garage. Uh, we didn't want to update it because that would uh, in, involve a lot of problems with the atomic bomb and uh, the new weapons that are used. So we tried to keep it back in the period in which uh, it was originally conceived. This would, I believe if I know my uh, paleontology, that would be a stinger.